Hello, this is Robert Brown with Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative. And we'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Digitalacha podcast. Digitalacha was developed to inspire creativity and enable educators to network in real time and share professional learning experiences to ensure equity and access for all in our remote rural areas, regardless of zip codes. All learners must be provided equal must be provided equitable opportunities that enable them to succeed both academically, emotionally, and socially. And we welcome you to visit our website and all of our learning resources at theholler.org, T-H-E-H-O-L-L-E-R.org. And within this network, we're having conversations with folks across the United States, focusing on the multiple professional learning opportunities. And I'm very excited today to am happy to welcome Dr. Ann Kaufman, who's the manager for teacher quality with the National Education Association. So welcome, Ann, uh, to, to the podcast. Uh, Thanks so, so much. It's good to be here. So, have you, so you've survived the ice storm, you said. We've survived the ice storm, but um, you know, my just as an apology, my my child is in the back in in uh, digital learning, so uh, we're surviving that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to go right along well with our podcast today, as we talk about uh, professional learning, which includes a digital learning. I was trying to think today, and when our when we first crossed paths, we were at so many meetings together. I couldn't remember if it was at a NASDAQ meeting, a digital promise meeting, a, a council of chief state school officers meeting, but somehow our paths crossed. And since then they crossed quite often. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny how that happened, but, and we were talking about professional learning at that time, specifically around um, my credentialing, et cetera, which we'll get into. But before we do that, tell us about yourself, about the National Education Association, NEA, uh, and the work that you guys do. Absolutely. So the National Education Association is the largest teachers union in the country. We've been in existence since the mid 1800s and have really been focused on social justice and professional learning issues all the way through. Not many people really know this, but uh, so, uh, many of the specialized professional associations like the National Councils of Teacher Education, National Councils of Teacher Mathematics, they were all housed within the NEA in the early 20th century. Um, they actually, AERA as well, began at NEA. So we've had a really long history of not only advocating for students and their educators, but also for um, the professional uh, aspects and the professional learning and knowledge of mm -hmm. our, our members and, uh, of, and for students. So it benefits students all the way around. Um, uh, over the last several years, um, NEA, uh, we take a much more direct pro approach in supporting professional learning for our educators, teachers, um, what we call ESPs, education support professionals, um, that make sure that they're prepared to be in their classrooms mm -hmm. and in their schools and that they feel safe to do so. So um, those that's very much with a social justice lens as well. I'm gonna have to pause. Bubby, I am recording a podcast. <laughs> Shoot, get it out, what do you need? That's very nice, thank you. But for the next little while, you can't interrupt me, okay? Okay. Oh, Sorry. That's per no, that's perfect. I'm glad that happened because that's what we're all dealing with right now. You know, as we're 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 working or working from home, having school from home in these virtual environments. So, and a lot of this work that you mentioned is a great segue. Plus, you, was that your daughter or son? That's my son. Your son. So we made a great segue for us because this these are the kind of supports that we want to talk about. So you, you alluded to this. So what are some of those specific uh, supports that EDA offers? To, ass to assist with the struggles of virtual teaching uh, that are absolutely. going on right now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we started in the pandemic, um, NEA teacher quality specifically hadn't been involved in blended learning courses and trainings for about three or four years. So it wasn't something that was foreign to us and it wasn't as big of a culture shock to go completely online for us as it was for a lot of others. So the NEA has been offering national um, online courses, facilitated courses, as well as uh, independent study courses across a number of um, professional learning, digital learning aspects uh, so that educators can try to, um, in some cases, just be more confident 
in their uh, technology skills so that they can do that teaching. Uh, we have also uh, the micro credentials that we do have. The NEA has over 180 individual micro credentials. We divided, we found the ones that didn't require a classroom to complete, as well as those that focus completely on technology and digital teaching. And so those were pulled out uh, front and center on the website. And um, we started creating uh, professional learning communities, both at a national level and a state level. Um, across many states to help support folks in that work. So it has really felt like a very uh, frenetic time since last March. A lot of new resources and supports have been created. Uh, we started a webinar series. Um, there's over 45 webinars uh, led all by educators, many of them technology coaches, uh, talking about things from how the heck do I do science online to how do I screencast and what are the best programs for screencasting. So it's really varied. Um, the states have been requesting to have certain ones for, for their members, and then we offer members to uh, be able to do that. I will say uh, everything I know about professional learning has really been turned on its head during this pandemic yeah. because you know all the research and everything I know says mm -hmm. that you know we need face-to-face -face. teachers do better learning together they're more likely you know they they're not they're not going to take independent study courses right like right. that was not something in fact NEA had a series of independent study courses about eight years ago it totally bombed that, like no one took them and they were big names yeah. like Linda Darling Hammond and you know really big names oh. and they bombed and now all of the independent study courses are the most popular type of professional learning that we offer and the micro credentials our uh, micro credential engagement has increased over 84 wow. percent since March <laughs> wow. so we've had a flurry of uh, folks turning things in uh, taking these courses and uh, being supported during this time. So it's actually a pretty exciting time as well to uh, learn what's working for folks. So when we talk about micro-credentials and, and, and we're with Kentucky Valley, Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative, we're, we're embedded deeply with those as well. And I, I've noticed that a lot of folks have different definitions of what micro-credentials are, how they use them. So when you talk about micro-credentials from NEA, can you give me a quick definition or a quick summary of what that looks like? Yeah, sure. So a micro-credential is a short performance assessment, essentially, that, that um, measures for proficiency in a particular skill or, or concept. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's not, I usually describe it to people like it's not uh, an elementary education degree certification. It's not that broad. broad. But learning how to group students, elementary students in small groups, is something mm -hmm. that would be considered a micro-credential skill. And then what happens is that all of the micro-credentials, all of the NEA micro-credentials, are based off of higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So that all the educators are asked to apply, synthesize, uh, reflect all of those higher level thinking skills so that we can actually see that it isn't just a regurgitation that they read something and they understand what it is, but they actually have to apply and reflect to make sure that they um, ha have shown that they have skill in that particular competency. And you mentioned, you know, independent studies really bombed, but when you look at the success of micro-credentials, you said you had 84% increase. How, how much of this success do you think that relates to micro-credentials can be independent, but they also can be completed with networks and with groups of teachers? How, how does that play into that success? Yeah, I, I mean, pre-pandemic, uh, all of our research said that, and I, other organizations have done it as well, and it, it, it all points to the fact that Educators are more likely to complete the micro-credential and be successful if they're not doing it by themselves, yeah. if they're doing it in a small learning community, which is why we've really been pushing professional learning communities as a, as a way to, to do this. Um, I do not believe that micro-credentials 
shouldn't necessarily be a, a, w- a quick way to just get your certification done right. that I, I understand we often have to check those boxes. I was a teacher and you have that last minute, you know, continuing professional development that you have to get done or you're not going to get your license or you're not going to get something and you're mm-hmm. always looking for something quick. And I see people um, going toward micro credentials for that. And yeah, it, it works, mm-hmm. but it, it, to me sort of misses the mark in terms of what the purpose should really be. So networks of educators really um, uh, promoting, supporting and implementing the micro credentials um, is only good for other educators. All of our micro credentials and all of our professional learning courses are written by educators for educators. So this is not a bunch of staff in a room writing things. This is us bringing in members to write. Everything is reviewed and, you know, made sure that it's accurate and all of those kinds of things. But um, yeah, this is definitely an opportunity for educators to have a voice in both the creation of the professional learning and then the implementation of it. So in in thinking about that work, and you said about this of isolation uh, or, or, or similar to that, I don't see my credentials as the one size fits all. It's got to be part of a system. Mm-hmm. Uh, how 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 do you see my credentials working within a system of professional learning? Yeah, I mean it it can't be the only thing. I know there's some push in the uh, community to have professional learning. To, well, let me say this: for all professional learning at a state level to be performance based, so mm-hmm. that we're not just um, you know, we're not just regurgitating information or sitting in a classroom to check a box or whatever it may be, but that the educator is able to truly show that they are proficient in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with that in, I mean, that will only improve our our educators and the experience of our our students. However, different people learn in different ways. And micro-credentials are not for everyone. They really aren't. Um, I think that if done together, uh, they can be a really powerful uh, learning experience for educators. But you know, micro credentials should be a part of a larger professional learning system. It really shouldn't be the only piece, but just that it is part of that. So you you mentioned that you work with micro credentials for many years, including your webinar series, etc. So your footprint has been. Uh, all across the United States. So in, in, in thinking about that, what state school districts are using your micro credentials and how are they using them? So what's interesting is that we do a data, a, a pretty hardcore data analysis quarterly of who's using them and try to analyze back to see where we can provide more supports to our affiliates or whatever it may be. And often there are districts that we've never worked with. Right. So there are definitely districts that we've never even heard of that are using them, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, But we also have um, a couple of examples. So I got a call from Hawaii. Um, They there was a principal uh, at a high school in Oahu who wanted to um, have micro credential PLCs in cooperation with the union. every week on English language learners. All of our English language learner micro-credentials have been approved by the state of Hawaii. And so we trained about, I think it was 12 facilitators at the school, they're all members, and they are running with cooperation of administration of this really powerful PLC within a school. So that the whole school is doing a micro-credential within this stack. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, that is pretty powerful because yeah, I don't remember that happening when I was a teacher, no. right? Like it just didn't work like that. Um, some other places, um, Wheaton Warrenville uh, in Illinois, that's just outside of Chicago. They've actually uh, built in collective bargaining language for micro credentials as part of their professional learning um uh, you know, requirements. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't something that they just did willy nilly. They had a year um, MOU between the union and the administration around how this would roll out and how much it would count for and all of those kinds of things. Um, and it's the micro credentials have just exploded there because the educators are able to receive credit 
for taking them, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're able to see that credit. So we can see huge numbers from just that one district um, really uh, being a part of that. So another place that has really started to get into, into the micro-credential uh, movement is the North Carolina group. There is a uh, partnership in North Carolina. They've brought in some national partners there and they're really trying to figure out what micro-credentials should look like in the state of North mm -hmm. Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now we have had, you know, some state level PLCs in North Carolina, but nothing at a large, at a large level. And quite frankly, I truly believe that that is because of the currency that may or may not be attached to it. So we can talk about uh, our micro-credentials hit all kinds of uh, states across the country and all kinds of uses from collective bargaining to professional learning communities for relicensure or for you know, regular PD credit within teacher preparation. We, we know of folks that are using them. Um, we use them for some of our union organizing skills as okay. well across the country. So uh, obviously those would not be appropriate for relicensure credit, but um, the, the currency attached to the micro-credential is how we really are going to gain traction. Yeah. So you know, let, let's, let's keep going with that frame of mind or that thought. And we talk about the currency, we talk about some impact within the higher ed, within, and then we keep coming back to how policy impacts. So in thinking about policy impacts, so what is revenue licensure, et cetera. So what policy do you think should or should not have happen with educators of uh, teachers learning or relicensure? What would you like to see happen? What would you hope doesn't happen? Right. So, um, my dream, <laughs> I, I think that a lot of the relicensure systems and licensure systems in general honestly need examined across the country um, when it comes to professional learning. Uh, part of that is because some of them have fundamentally just gone off the rails. And some of it is that we don't want to just have a micro-credential be an add-on, right? right? It's a relatively new um, mode of professional learning for um for educators, and I get, uh, you know, uh, administration states being leery about just approving what's out there because the quality across the micro credentials really varies uh, depending on the organization, depending on, um, you know, how they're creating them. I mean, classroom teachers are often working with micro credentials with their students, which I yeah. think is actually really cool, um, but is at a different level, right? Mm -hmm. And we've certainly talked about this before, Robert. There's no sort of, uh, we've started to try to find as like-minded partners, uh, principles of quality around what micro-credential systems and micro-credential themselves should really look like. Right. And the uh, Council Chief State School Officers document that we worked on with Digital Promise mm -hmm. and, and you all and some other partners, I think starts to get at some of that, yeah. but it, it doesn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. um, if I was in a state uh, department of education and I'm trying to figure out what um, micro-credentials how do I know what's good and what's not good, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's really confusing. So I, I think in, the, in our current system, if I were a state, I would, and I, Delaware started to do this, I believe, um, that they bring together a group of educators to vet the micro-credentials that they're, they are thinking about using mm -hmm. so that it's not all on the staff, right? right. Who are already overtaxed and busy but also includes the professional knowledge and expertise of the educators within that state, as they will truly know what is the best content, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, educators are very critical of what is quote unquote good and quote unquote bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a state being able to create some sort of council or small committee of educators that can help them review micro-credentials and perhaps identify either um, what they need to include or what, um, you know, what that looks like would be really important. Now, in an ideal world, this would be at a national level. Right. I think that is going to be a really hard thing to happen. Um, of course, the, those of us who, uh, have micro-credentials have certainly been talking about what does a national sort of governing board look like, 
Um, it's a little weird to have the issuers of micro credentials be the ones regulating the micro credentials yeah. because then it could be at folks' self interest. Not that we would do that, of course not, because we, you know, for lots of reasons, we're not a for profit entity at all. Mm -hmm. But um, there are for profit entities out there, and the differences between various micro credentials can be really, really confusing. So, um, I mean, Ideally, there would be some national guidelines or something like that. I don't, reading the tea leaves, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I, I could be wrong, but I just, I just really don't see it. One thing that I do, no, I was just going to say, one thing I do not want to happen is that micro-credentials start to be the replacement for teacher preparation right. or for, or they start to become an alternative certification route. So that if I take these 12 micro credentials, then I can teach. No, <laughs> that is not necessarily what that should mean. Yeah. So, um, you know, we certainly have evidence of, of higher education institutions, you know, having course, having placements, and then folks either testing out with a micro credential or using it as a way to show that they have proficiency in a certain skill. That's perfectly appropriate. But, um, having them serve as the way for folks to enter the profession is just not enough. And that's not meant to be because it's a barrier. It's more meant, these are discrete skills that if you don't have a foundation, aren't gonna make sense, quite frankly. So you keep talking and back around to this. This is that system and we've had this conversation ourselves. This is be part of that system within higher ed as well. And we talked about the alternative uh, programs, what a great way for higher ed and these alternative certified individuals to begin the process of using my credentials. Like you said, some of these distinct specific skills, using micro credentials as part of, I hate to use this word, but I'm going to, that boot camp part before you go into a program, to get some of these essential skills and competencies before you go into that classroom. And then while you're in your program at the university, You've had these competencies to get you prepared before you go in there, but it's part of that system. I think that's a, I think that's a great way to look at that. I want to swing back to something else you've said because I've written it on my notes three times to make sure I don't forget this. Prayer professionals, how are you using your micro credentials and your learning for those guys? Because often, and I'm glad you brought that up, they're left out in this conversation, and we have got to keep them in this conversation because they're on the front line with the kids as well. So how are your micro credentials and the other learning experiences you have be, being addressed with the prayer professionals, used with prayer professionals? So at the very beginning of the pandemic, we actually had a couple of states. They were keeping their ESPs, including paraeducators, employed mm -hmm. by going through micro credentials because it was uh, viewed as professional learning and therefore they were able to keep them employed at least you know, for a little while which helped quite a few folks. Um, we have been trying to do um, PLCs with, the, with our, we call them ESP, paraeducators are a part of that. There's several other job categories included in there, such as bus drivers and cafeteria workers and technology folks. I mean, they're all within that classification. They have, um, there's uh, the professional growth continuum for ESPs that NEA uh, put out probably about four or five years ago now, and then we have corresponding micro-credentials for each. What I will say, and what we've really found over the past year, the ESPs, when it comes to the micro-credentials, really need more scaffolded supports um, to help break down what the words that we are all used to, the lingo, all the time, um, so that they can be successful. So that has really been our big learning around ESP micro-credentials. We have... Um, we have a, also have a group of micro-credentials called Building Winning Teams, which is a, um, it's meant, it's a curriculum. We have a course, and then we also have micro-credentials focused on a classroom teacher and a paraeducator working together effectively. Because if you've ever co-taught, <laughs> that can be a little uh, rough if you don't have some agreed upon you know, how you're going to operate together and those kinds of things. Yeah. So yeah, that, uh, there is that, that as well. And, and we're actually in our, in our office working on micro-credentials, uh, co-teaching micro-credentials to help get at some of that as well. 
Yeah. Uh, now you've mentioned so many resources, your my credentials webinar series. So if folks wanted to see what you have, how do they get access? Yeah, absolutely. So if you are looking for the general resources that I mentioned, you would just go to nea.org and we have a, a redesigned website as of September. Um, so you can search there and for any of the keywords that would be of interest to you by either topic or thing, like you could do micro credentials there. Mm -hmm. If you are also, if you just want to go straight to the micro credentials, it, the NEA.org site will direct you to nea.certificationbank.com. And that is where we house all that. That's our system for both, um, you know, showing all of them, displaying all the micro credentials and then having individuals submit as well as um, assessed all within that portal. As of January 1, uh, all of our micro credentials are, remain free for all members. Non members, we are now charging $75, and that is all going to assessing, assessing the micro credential. We could spend an entire webinar just talking about the needs for assessing micro credentials. Right. That would, we, we won't go there today, but maybe on a follow up sometime, we'll be part of that conversation because that would be. Now, uh, Anne, I appreciate your time today. Do you have any final comments about the professional learning as we work through this virtual world uh, before we sign off for today? Yeah, I, I'm really excited about the potential. I, the pandemic, of course, has been this mm. awful <laughs> experience. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. that's an understatement. But the positive and potential change that we see in educators and just people's understanding of what professional learning mm -hmm. is and what's available and how teaching with um, technology can actually help in um, you know, educating our students. Uh, we, 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 we will have probably made more strides with that piece during this time than we ever have before. And I think that we, we would definitely not be where we are without that push for educators to really understand what it means to teach online. Um, and I, I am not saying that everyone needs to, um, you know, there's high flex, hybrid, concurrent, dual teaching, like there's all these different models across the yeah. spectrum. Yeah. And certainly the average teacher who has not had experience doing this, um, what we call high flex teaching, mm -hmm. where you're teaching online and you're teaching in person at the same time, it's crazy. Right. Um, there are ways to do it with the appropriate resources that work, but yeah. this widespread, um, you know, that piece, we have to get that under control. Right. Um, but the learnings from how it all works and how mm -hmm. it all gets put together, I think, will really be the long lasting impact of the pandemic on this professional learning space. And that's the reason I wanted to have you on here and talk about these resources because as teachers are out there learning as they're doing, as you, as you say, and my credentials are part of that, but the other resources that are available for educators to help us get this through this pandemic. But there's always the next thing in the road. And as I like to say, out of ashes rise the phoenix, so we, with this conflict, some great things could happen as a result. So in going to the NEA.org, uh, oh, that's sweet. Uh, first, if you can't, if you're just listening to our it's probably been heard in this video, it's beautiful. Uh, but uh, uh, NEA.org, and you will find all these resources, and you can reach out to it. And directly, if they wanted to contact you more information, how could they contact you or someone in your office directly? Absolutely. So uh, my name again is Ann Kaufman and my email is A-C-O-F-F-M-A-N at NEA.org. And if I am not the right person, then I will direct you to the right person. Well, thank you, Ann, for being with us today. And again, this is Robert Brown on behalf of the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative, and we will catch you next time. Thanks, Robert.